Welcome back to the Soul Collective Podcast. I am so grateful you're here. My guest today is a medical Qigong educator, practitioner, author, and public speaker. I am so, so grateful to be connecting with Serena Stone. We're going to be talking all about connecting with your own sacred pleasure and sexuality. Serena, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's just fun. It is so fun. You know, we were chatting a little bit before we started recording and, you know, I've never recorded an episode that's specifically dedicated to exploring pleasure and sexuality. And I feel like it is such an important topic, you know, reflecting back on ancient cultures, there's so many of them. Um, India is an excellent example, but they really recognized and celebrated this innate connection between spirituality and sexuality. And somewhere along the line, um, that kind of got lost or that message got distorted. And I know this is a big question, but I'd love to know from you, you know, how you think that message got lost and what it would mean to really connect with that, those aspects of ourselves. Oh, we're just going to start with the small stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> that's a multidimensional question. So let, let's chip away at it. If we study history and, and you know, clearly you have a, a bit, a long time ago, one of the magic uh, elements to being human was uh, surrounding sex, sexuality, but I, I, I want to put another word in there, and that's reproduction. Reproduction is a big deal, okay? The energy that it takes to produce a sperm or produce an egg, the energy that it takes for the two to combine and make you know, a, a living creature uh, is, is uh, atomic. I mean, it's huge, that amount of energy. So a really long time ago, when, you know, when they had what some of us call sacred sex or sacred sexuality, this did not really start about pleasure, although pleasure is a serious repercussion of, you know, playing with sexual energy. It, it really is like apples and oranges. When you play with sexual energy in a, in a, a more sacred, loving way, it feels very, very different than hooking up at the bar, okay? Yeah. So how do I think that this, this knowledge that we carry an energy that could be used for health, longevity, and to connect with something bigger than, than this physical plane, how do I think that we forgot about that and sex stopped being sacred? I don't know, maybe the Mayans had something when they realized there's golden ages and the bronze and the, you know, the dark and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Somehow we slipped into an age where slowing down and cultivating ourselves as homo sapiens, you know, so that we could evolve. Uh, somehow we just forgot about all that. It, it, how did it happen? I, I don't know. I just know that it did. And it was a planet-wide movement toward paying more attention to survival instead of being a human. So when we're in survival, that's pretty much it. That's what we think about. And now it's all about the money and it's all about what we need to do to get our needs met. And the beautiful thing about darkness, which this is like our shadow side of sexuality and our shadow side of humanity that we're seeing sometimes, you know, in the seat of that darkness is a little crack where the light can come through. Leonard Cohen said that, not me. <laughs> and that's what I choose to focus on. I choose to focus on those people, young and old, who have this sense that there's a potential for something beautiful here, that letting down the walls and opening the heart mm. can be the most healing thing we've ever done. Then you can go have sex. If you have now ever stayed up all night long, 
connecting with another person and having the kind of sex that like, it is so not boring, okay? It is wonderful and magical. And like you open your eyes and it looks like there's Vaseline on the camera lens and your partner looks so beautiful and everything feels so great. And you get about three hours of sleep that night, but you still go to school or work the next day and you have tons of energy come on, till about two in the afternoon and then you wanna die, right? But you have tons of energy for hours and hours. That's okay. So the, then, then that's the experience of having healthy sex. Hmm. Okay, so. <laughs> so much there, so much there. And I think there's two things that really, really stand out from what you've shared so far. And the first is, you know, you mentioned slowing down. And I think that is so, so key you know we're living in a day and age where we have so many advances in technology and there is this fast-paced rhythm that we can get caught up in and i know for myself personally when i feel you know the sexiest it's when i really take the time for myself which is the second thing that you mentioned where as you know sex and our relationship to our own sexuality really begins with ourself and our own intimate connection, our own, you know, self-love, our own ability to connect with our hearts. I mean, there's just so much there. What would you say in your experience, you know, the deepening of that journey of self-love and how that connects with, you know, our own ability just to experience pleasure, any form of pleasure? I think that self-love is a part of another concept, and that is the stories that we hold in our mind and our heart. It's very hard to love ourselves if there was an episode in our childhood or you know an episode in our life that we perceived ourselves as not enough, not okay, or not worthy. It is shocking how many people actually don't believe they're worthy of love, love connection, okay? So I think a lot of what has to happen is everybody needs to accept that when we see in another person an ugly story that we have the awareness of that ugly story because it is in us somehow. These repetitive stories are the byproduct of a, of a belief system. And that coming full circle to your self-love and slowing down and knowing the self, there are stories that prevent us from having a really simple reality, which is that I am unique. I am perfect the way that I am. I am eternal. I am worthy. If I've got a story that proves over and over again that those statements are false, I'm going to be unconscious out there and I'm going to continue to recreate my true, my, my story. Yeah. So you see how, how complex this gets? It is. Yeah. I mean, I can totally... I understand what you're saying about stories, you know, because we've all been there. We've all felt some form of story in our lives. And I do believe that coming into a greater sense of love is really truly allowing ourselves to love every single part of ourselves. And yeah. that's a huge, and, you know, you know, what's amazing about that is that those who have had the experience of just stepping into what I like to call the frequency of love, um, it, it is true what all the mystics have said. In that moment, it is so easy to love everything and everyone. It's yeah. so easy to have gratitude and appreciation for little things. And then this whole feeling of purposelessness, that's a good word, that feeling of not knowing what your purpose is or, or not fulfilling your purpose, it just poof, disappears. Yeah. And I, I totally, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just gonna say that I, I 
love what you're saying. And I really believe that that comes to, you know, uh, really being selfish with, you know, the, your time and your energy to cultivate that sense of self-love, yes. you know, because it really is a matter of putting yourself first yes. in order to explore that and find that. I'm still working on myself. I probably will. And I don't know till I can't think anymore. And um, uh, Richard Rudd, he wrote a, a book that's fantastic, yes. right? The Gene Keys, and it's my Bible. And um, I'm taking his course right now uh, as, as an online course. And he said the funniest thing. He said, look at the word avoidance and then break it up and call it the avoid dance. And I actually sent a friend of mine a picture of this dance where the girl like dances her way out of the room and disappears. It was really <laughs> funny, right? The avoid dance. Yes. And I'm expert at it, by the way. I have done more crossword puzzles than, you know, well, I've done as many as all my old friends. <laughs> <laughs> Anything not to think about this. Anything to avoid. And by the way, um, we, let's go back to the sex thing. We can definitely use sex to avoid how we feel. So a sex can be a, one of the avoid dances, but I think when we use sex in that way, we're just driving home such ugly stories. And I'm shaking my head and closing my eyes because how it feels to just allow your body to be used for somebody else to get off is so damn unhealthy. It is, you can't blame your partner. You gotta take a look in the mirror and say, what the hell story do I have that makes it okay to just give my energy away like that and get nothing but ice in return? And if I think sometimes that rock bottom thing works because I what I saw in my when I was working a lot and teaching a lot was people just hit a they would hit the wall. They could not make themselves have that kind of sex ever again. And they didn't know how to do anything else. Now they will stop, breathe, take a moment, and let's look at this and stop doing the avoid dance. Mm -hmm. And this can look like anything. Yes, I teach something. I, you know, I, I have a, a program that I teach that helps a person to get in touch with their emotions, then learn how to transform negative energy into positive vitality. I mean, emotional energy, you know, get the body ready, get the mind ready, then add sexual energy, or what, like I said before, reproductive energy, and begin to build the feelings of balance. It's, we don't even focus on self-love, and we definitely don't focus on your story. Yeah. Don't focus on the story at that point. We just focus on doing the practice for the practice sake so I have this thing, right? And thousands and thousands of people around the world, because I didn't make it up. I'm just teaching what I was taught. Thousands and thousands of people around the world have found these particular practices done in a particular order, bring a person to a place of self-awareness. Self-awareness will then lead you to another teacher and that will lead you to another experience and so on and so on until we can evolve, right? Yes. Uh, but I'm not the only path. There's a ton of them out there. I want to throw something out before we move on. Um, I'll probably get a little bit of bad press about this, but now I'm I'm older and I don't actually I don't care. So I want to say something. Um, I have friends from India, and I have experienced actually even here in America um, some pretty amazing tantra teachers. You talked about India setting an example. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so their, their practices for cultivating reproductive energy and then using that energy with another person or the self to raise your frequency so high that you actually start altering your DNA. You start juicing up your cells and ramping up your physical body, which opens you up to another energetic experience which some may call sexuality, excuse me, which some may call spirituality. Sorry, wrong word. Yeah. Okay, when you raise the frequency enough, it actually feels pretty spiritual because most of us don't live there. Here's where I'm going to get in a, just a little bit of trouble. Okay, 
Tantra in its original form is unbelievably beautiful and it will rip you open as a human being. I mean, just the concept of consent, consent, what does it mean? And going deep into that, that is a tantric concept, okay? To make sure that, you know, everybody involved is in this together. And, and I mean, that, that's an amazing concept. In the Tao, uh, we are not interested in your story. Just focus on the practice. You still get to the same place, but it's a different kind. It's more of a young path, like ma masculine path. And then we have this more yin or feminine path coming out of India. And India and China, they're right there. They're right next to each other on, on, on the planet, right? So they actually fill in the pieces together. When you put them together, it's pretty profound. So I actually have taught a course with Dr. Deborah Mites. Uh, who, she taught the tantric part. I taught the Tao part. And it was a course about sex. And it was pretty great. Here's the warning for folks, though. In America, because again, we started monetizing everything and we got into survival and we totally lost our way, some of us. Tantra became just about sex. That is not the original Tantra. No, right? I'm looking at you, you're shaking your head. No, no, the original Tantra was deep, spiritually deep. And it started with the individual. And then when we raise our energy to a certain place and we're clean and we're open and we're safe, safe in ourself, then what the tantric practices teach us about how to share energy with another person is pretty specific. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I want to go back to the self because I think this is so powerful for people to dive into and explore. You know, you talked about the avoid dance, which I love. And for me, it's like what that brings up is the word intimacy, right? Like the opposite of that is true, deep, rich intimacy. And where does intimacy begin? It begins with the self and truly knowing the self, honoring the self. I, I believe that any sacred union starts with our own you know, personal connection. And so I'd love to explore that a little bit more. You know, I know that you help clients through this journey of really you know, self-exploration, removing any and all blocks or stories, um, and really coming into a greater sense of self-love and self-honoring, um, and really how some of those practices help with and things like anti-aging and things like, you know, coming into recognizing our own radiance. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You ask questions that have, I told you before we, we started to, to film, that you will ask a question that takes 10 seconds to ask and I will give you a five minute answer. <laughs> so um, th th again, you know, there, there's a lot of, of um, sub subjects in there. Okay, well, let's, let's start at the beginning. Uh, how do I help folks? So my training was with a Tao master named Mantak Chia and he is arguably the most famous Taoist medical Qigong educator on the planet at this time. And he has a huge body of written work and video work. So I learned formulaically, right? How would a Taoist monk 5,000 years ago, you know, how would they begin this journey of peeling away the layers of the human onion? You know, how do we get to this place of nothing? where all things can manifest, right? In the middle of an onion is, is actually an empty space. In the middle of everything is an empty space. So how do we peel away enough stuff safely, by the way, safely to get there? And so I'll give you an example and, and um, I'll let your folks know this. Um, on my website, there is um, an audio meditation called The Inner Smile. And it is the front line of training. I've, I've worked with people from four to 94, not exaggerating, to do this little practice. It is the little practice that we all go back to in the Tao system, where we acknowledge, that's why you need a teacher. You have to acknowledge that your emotions make energy. And so we have a little chat and I just show you some stuff um, so you can feel how being sad makes your body feel a certain way, being 
paranoid and anxious makes your body feel a certain way. Being in love makes your body feel a certain way. Just chilling with your friends <laughs> makes your body feel a certain way. A conversation with a cool friend that when you're driving home or after they leave, you're buzzing from it. This is all emotional responses and the body mirrors the emotional response, okay? So we need a teacher to just do what I just did, basically, and take a few minutes and go, your emotions make things happen in your body and then outside as well. And they definitely cloud your perception, okay? So then we can say, all right, now that's all I have to say. I'm not asking you about your experiences. I'm gonna give you this meditation. Close your eyes, smile to your heart. Inhale, love, smile, collect the hatred and cruelty, exhale, use a sound, ha. Oh. Let the dark gray cloud of hatred and, and anger, hastiness and impatience, leave your heart through your mouth. There's a few more little pieces in there. You can smile to the red pheasant. You can see the eternal red fire that's in your heart. That's the element. And we learn this practice for the heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, spleen, and pancreas, okay? And that's how we might begin in the Tao system to transform negative energy into positive vitality. Because as we age, what we don't want to do is just constantly delete or um, release. It's really popular. It was really popular in the 60s and 70s. Release your trauma, release your pain. Terrific. What are you going to replace it with? And if you keep re releasing your energy, eventually you're like a shell of a human being. And so what we don't want is also to only get rid of negative thoughts or negative emotions and then think you're going to survive just on the happy stuff. It doesn't work that way. What we want is balance. Mm -hmm. That is an attainable goal. I just want to balance out my courage and righteousness with the sadness and depression. And it's going to change the, the sadness and depression to something that I've never tried before. Serena, how do we bring in more chi, more life force energy into the body? How about first focus on that practice I just talked about? Instead of bringing it in, how about if you just transform what you've got? Now, that is an unusual concept. So maybe this is a conversation that's really cool for your show because that's not a conversation we have every day. What do you mean? I just want to bring in the good stuff and then I want to let go of the bad stuff. How about if you just breathe in the good stuff, exhale the bad stuff, and focus on balance? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I mean, it's just that simple. And through balance, we may be creating our own, which is the goal in the Tao, creating our own clean, positive life force. And, it, and it'll continue to raise and transform. So we call that in Chinese, we call that life force chi. And right, they call it prana in India, right? But it's all the same thing. It's electromagnetic energy, it's real. And, and a lot of people, they go to the spiritual place and, and, and that's okay, it's not my training. So, you know, I didn't go to seminary or anything, but I've definitely had the experience of having enough chi and that, that's balanced and, and good in my body where sure feels like spirit. I've had experiences where I'm very positive that my eternal self and this physical body are actually two different entities. I'm positive. Nobody can take it away from me. If that ain't spirituality, I don't know what is. So once we understand that we're these chi machines, then we can start to play with bringing in chi from the outside. And how can we do it? That's a class. That is actually, uh, we don't, I, I can't just throw it out there in a couple of minutes. But there are so many ways to pull in the energy of a spiraling galaxy into the body, into your home, into your office. 
There are wonderful pathways to pull in the energy of blue water and bring it through the body to wash away infection, wash away pain. I mean, medical Qigong, you can study it for your whole life. Mm -hmm. You know, I love for me personally, I love the practice of Kundalini and, you know, it is through the movement and the breath through the central channel that I feel just so much of an energizing of life force energy. So I know that there are so many different practices that we can explore. Yeah. And I think that's what's fun about it is that we are infinite creator beings. So everybody is gonna have their own unique way. And of course there's ways that we can cultivate and tap in and you know classes that we can take to explore. Um, but one thing I would say is just like, if this is speaking to you and this is something that you wanna like try and experiment with as this cultivation is, you know, figuring out ways of bringing in more life force energy and also attuning to your own sort of energetic ecosystem. You know, we all know when we're feeling like depleted or we're feeling, you know, like our energy is low, really having a greater sense of awareness about that. And then it's like, okay, what can we do to cultivate that chi? You know, maybe it's relaxing, maybe it's taking a salt bath, maybe it's, you know, walking out in nature. There's so many different yeah. ways. So I'm going to invite your listeners to try the Taoist way. Um, uh, what I did, uh, just before we did this interview was on my website. Um, I put a 30 minute consultation on sale so that, that there's a price drop on that one. And for those who get a 30 minute consultation, there is a free inner smile audio download. Put it in your phone, on your tablet, whatever, and listen to it. Um, you just follow along and you'll learn the inner smile that's it. And once you get it, I really encourage you to go teach it to somebody else because this is, it's pretty amazing stuff. But with a 30 minute Beautiful. consultation, we're going to find out if we're a good match. Yeah. And I, I got to be honest, I know all kinds of good stuff. Like the, I do yoga as well. And I think you were talking about Kundalini yoga. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, it's funny. I was just hanging out with an Indian family last night. Oh, and she's in her 80s. You must do your yoga. You must do your yoga every day. You know, and I'm like, I know, I know, Auntie. You know? <laughs> do I? No, no, I don't. But I sure, I certainly feel better on the days that I do. Anyhow, um, we can find out, you know, in one chat if the Dao way is good. If it's not, I have all kinds of other ideas, you know, for things that people can try. You just gotta, and it's not even finding your life path. This is just about finding the path for right now. Mm. What inspires a person right now to just take, I'm never gonna ask somebody to take an hour a day when I first meet them, not gonna happen. But what would inspire somebody to take 15 minutes at least four or five days a week? What is it? For me, it was the Tao way. I, I like the Tao way as a young person because Nobody told me what was going to happen next. Nobody told me what I had to think or do. Like, you know, uh, I mean, as far as like how I felt, okay? Mm -hmm. They just said, here's a formula. First think this, then think that, finish off with this thing, and then have an experience. Bye-bye. Yeah. Now, that I could do. As a young girl, I didn't like anybody telling me what to do, except for give me the instructions and then please don't micromanage me right? Okay. <laughs> so the Tao way worked for me because it was really a lot of independent study until I took about two decades of my life and spent it with Master Chia. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, but I was really ready. And that was after years of self-study. So, you know, is the Tao way right for a person now? At least we could find out. And as far as the sexual training goes, I mean, that is a really long conversation that involves things like men being multi-orgasmic, okay? It's a really deep <laughs> talk mm -hmm. about what would it look like for a man to start training in the Tao. Yeah, so much to explore there. Um, I actually wanna go back to something that you said, which is about attuning to our own pleasure and really how we're sort of, 
co-creating with the universe and manifesting because you talked about really not having to know like all the steps ahead or, you know, cause sometimes, you know, we worry about like, what is my purpose and what am I doing here? And what is the next thing? And I really believe that the more that we attune to our own sacred pleasure, the more that we'll be able to be on this really fun, abundant path of discovery, you know, because it is just like falling the thing that lights you up, that brings you joy. Um, that is on your heart to, you know, focus on, to create, to, um, you know, that energizes you. And through that, it's, it's not worrying about, you know, what's happening in the future, you know, cause you're really focused in on that present moment. And I think that's one of the greatest benefits of attuning to our own pleasure. What did you think I was going to add to that? <laughs> <laughs> um, that isn't a question. That is a profoundly intelligent statement. Well, I okay. I think what you want is for your listeners to know that what you just said is real. And that I can do. That I can tell you that attuning to your pleasure, whether it means I love gardening or I love cuddling with my beloved, tuning into your own pleasure and understanding that that is a sign that you're on the right path. It, that in itself is an area of study. I think, the, I think the missing in our culture is that I don't know very many people who were raised by a, a person that has the knowledge that you have right now. I have to be honest, I chose not to have children. Okay, we, if we had more people on the planet having children who have the knowledge that you have, eventually the evolution is going to kick into a different gear we're going to do accelerated accelerated evolution now so well i see this with you know young souls coming into the world you know they don't have all the stuff Ooh, and the goosebumps. <laughs> oh my God, I, just got, woo, I got the goosebumps <laughs> yes it's, there's so much that's taking place right now i i truly truly believe that and i love how you just shared all of these beautiful ways that we can connect with with pleasure whether it's you know connecting with a pet or a beloved or just spending time with ourselves and you know i think one of the things and i'd love to get your perspective on this i think one of the things that that can get in our way is you know, the people pleasing and, you know, putting other people first. I feel like, and I know this in my own personal journey is like when I focus so much on like what other people wanted or expected from me, it really was hard for me to even know what pleasure was, you know, what yeah. was it that was going to bring me pleasure. So it was like going on that own path of self-exploration and giving myself, you know, permission to do that. Okay, so you, you've already got the concepts, all right? You, you have the concept of uh, putting you before me is not working, <laughs> okay? So <clears throat> here's my experience, is that when we just take some time and we're clear on our, per our purpose, this is what I'm here to do. Uh, all that stuff of trying to fulfill our purpose by by serving other people and doing that um that avoid dance that's really and it it can be used as an avoid dance okay to i'm so i'm out there being a of you know service to the community i am falling apart as an individual but i'm doing good things for others happens every day this is it's just it's a part of our our spiritual and personal growth eventually you run out of energy or chi and you realize I could do better. I don't mean I could do better for myself. I mean, I could do better out there. I'm bringing a half a human being to the game. And now I'm starting to put on my game face because I'm falling apart, but I need to go out there and be of service to other people because I said I would and yada, da, 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 and I just crazy. So, when a, per when a person takes a little time and figures out that your purpose is to have a great life, your purpose, that whole, that whole pleasure thing that you were talking about that is, a, is so elusive, right? Um, 
it's not elusive when our focus is on having a great life and, and only taking actions and having conversations that keep us in a good frequency, mm. in light and wonderful and loving. Okay. Yes. Once we focus on the self and working on the self and all these layers of stories that have to get out of there, that thing where we start trying to get happiness from outside of ourselves, it just clears itself up. Yeah. The conversation just goes away. And then all of a sudden, what you bring to the table for any project or conversation, you work smarter, not harder. And if you can surround yourself with like-minded others, you begin to create major projects of distinction. And it's fun and it's easy. And you see everybody for who they are. And you don't mind that everybody sees you for who you are. Now, getting there, that's the journey. And that can be, you know, that should, I think it should be embraced. Mm -hmm. I think the shadow side should be embraced so you can get, you know, to the fun stuff. And through after the fun stuff, we get, you know, uh, some self-mastery and, and, and some change there. But I am amazed at how many ways I personally have created to distract myself from being with myself. And I keep trying to feed my ego with these distractions because I'm going to go be of service, right? I was a teacher. That, that's what I did. I taught, you know, energy work. Isn't that profound? And the truth is that at the end of the year, when I'd only been home for like three months and not in a row uh, the whole year, and I could barely walk because I was so exhausted and nobody had any idea what was going on for me. Um, the truth is that there were times where I used my actual career and being of service to my global community as a horrible distraction. And how do I know? Because it didn't feed my body, it depleted it. Mm. And so I bring this depleted creature to the classroom or this depleted creature to the project in the community. Well, you know, I've, I've worked through a lot of that stuff now, but the universe made it hard. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, I actually severely injured myself last year and I call it my on purpose. Yeah. I had to sit there for many months because I couldn't walk and I couldn't use my left hand either and just be. And my doctor went, yay, you have to be with you now. I, I'm so excited for you. Yeah. Right? So, that was a really long-winded answer about this, about how to, you know, who to connect with and, and, and how to find pleasure. True pleasure is an internal situation. It is an internal perception. It's like art. Put 10 people in the room, you're going to get at least eight different things. The two that connect with each other should probably be friends, you know, <laughs> because they, we finally have two humans that speak the same language. How is it that we do that? How do we speak the same language when everybody perceived their upbringing differently and everybody's upbringing was different and we have all these crazy stories? It is a miracle that we connect at all. But those who connect in the same frequency, all of a sudden they're bonded. Mm -hmm. Even if you're connecting in the frequency of I'm a drug addict, they will go and find other drug addicts and they bond. Those who um, have a negative addiction, they find other people that feed that negative addiction in some way and they bond. But guess what? As we evolve and we don't have the negative addiction and you know we're not a drug addict and all this other crap, the more we focus on the good, and understand that the bad is what we went through to get here or what we're going through to get there. And it's right there is actually happening right now. The more we have that revelation, the more we start noticing other people around us that have the same, they know the same thing I do. Mm. I didn't even hear them before. They just were speaking in poetry and you know, metaphor. What the hell is that? But now all of a sudden I see what they see I see what you see for sure. 
And now we can do something with that. Mm. How can we have some fun? It makes me feel good. It makes you feel good. And we're doing a project a distinction that actually makes a difference in a positive way. And guess what? It'll work because our frequency is so high. That, yeah, of course, we're going to manifest what's in our, on our, in our hearts and on our minds. We kind of veered away from sex, but honestly, not really. Yeah. The practices from around the world, whether it's the thing that I teach, you know, the Taoist concepts of, you know, cultivating sexual energy and using it or Tantra or I don't know, Native American. And I mean, they all have something right from they have all these different wonderful ideas about how sex and sexual energy can feed human evolution. Um, we didn't really stray from it that far in the Tao way until you have a grip on your sexual energy, you don't get to go any further. It is actually considered a basic practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once That's you're not running around, letting your uterus tell you what to do <laughs> or um, some story about how you're supposed to have a partner. And this is what always happens when you try to have one. Once all that's gone, we can talk about something else. And you show up as a creature who is more balanced. Mm -hmm. uh, emotional state is one that you could actually trust because they're pretty transparent and they're okay with who they are, you know, to a certain point. I mean, it just gets better and better and better as we, as we you know, go beyond just sex and sexuality. But I have to say that, the, you know, <laughs> the sex stuff uh, is so needed because it helps open the heart. And it's fun. It's fun for a lady to take her orgasmic energy and instead of having it, the, the direction of it to go out of the body, but reverse it. It's just a contraction into your body. You can reverse that so that every time you have an orgasm, it goes back inside mm. and then learn how to circulate it. I'm like, woo. I mean, that's makes learning about the sex part really fun. And I, I won't go into detail, but I do have a partner and I can tell you that it is a journey that does not end. I mean, it's too, it's, it's, it's too much to, to, you know, to talk about without the, the foundation of understanding the practices, mm -hmm. but I can tell you as, as far as connected sexual experience goes, there is another way to do this than this, oh, I hope it's good this time, you know, point of view or having a partner where you want to connect, but you don't, but you do it anyways. And all this crap that, mm -hmm. you know, we hear about or experience ourselves, this technique of uh, the Tao way is, it's an ever unfolding flower. I mean, my body does stuff that I've only read about and I didn't really try. I just continued with the practice and then I got the right partner. Yeah, it sounds like you followed your own your own sacred pleasure. And I love that so much. And, you know, I love the transparency that you share with, you know, I just so appreciate you, you know, sharing your own journey. And I think that, you know, perhaps many can relate to um, maybe, you know, some of what you shared of like feeling burnt out or feeling like, you know, at times it was like, um, really not fully checking in with what you were fully desiring. And I feel like that is the new energy that's being called for right now as we co-create, you know, the new earth is like really checking in with what feels in the greatest alignment, letting stuff go that feels um, heavy or that feels cumbersome or that feels, you know, just like there's a lot of resistance there and just following more of what lights you up and tuning to your heart. And so just thank you so much for sharing your heart, sharing your light, sharing your journey and, you know, all these incredible teachings and wisdom that you have. This has been such an amazing conversation. It's a pleasure. I'll give you a fun thing to play with uh, because I can tell that, that you really get get this energy um, and how important it is. 
if you want to uh, test yourself to see how willing you are in this moment to to slow down and and have faith in the process <clears throat> suggest to yourself or your lady or guy friend that you're talking to that before they have sex with this individual they think is really hot wait for an emotional bonding <laughs> Wait for an emotional bonding before you get naked with another person and watch how they start tap dancing around that. <laughs> um, sometimes you have that conversation with yourself. Sometimes you'll have it with somebody else. But in our culture at this time, you would identify yourself as a very different human being. And you will also uninvite those who would touch you inappropriately. And I don't know anything about your personal life, but I'm just saying to you or any of your listeners, um, you, de you do really cut down on the, you know, creepy sexual experiences by waiting for an emotional bonding. And yeah. uh, people like don't want to wait. They're like, no, I'd rather throw the dice and see if it sucks. <laughs> yeah, I will share, you know, and this may sound a little bit, you know, crazy to some, but my my partner and I, my husband, um, you know, we waited till till marriage to to consummate our relationship and you know that's not a path for for everyone but um you know I, I can share personally that you know to your sharing of having that emotional connection and intimacy prior to um that physical connection was was so so profound in our relationship so i can you knew he wanted you and you knew he wasn't going to leave you and I'm sorry, but if that doesn't help a girl just relax and open her heart, I just don't know. I mean, what more can another person do? This is all about you. We know that. And we totally acknowledge that. But we also acknowledge that we're not on this planet alone. And in this scenario, with you know a marriage, that is a partnership. That is an agreement between two people. We shouldn't have to micromanage it, and we shouldn't doubt it. Amen. <laughs> Amen, goddess. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> You're amazing. Thank you, Serena. So Thank much you. love and gratitude to you and to everyone listening.